All right, welcome everyone. For today's edition of the UC ANR Water webinar, we have Kristen Dobbin speaking. Um, she's a new CE specialist at UC Berkeley in the Environmental Science Policy and Management Department. She just started in October. We're really happy to have her. Um, prior to joining Berkeley, she was at the Luskin Center um, uh, at UCLA as a postdoc and was getting her PhD um, in ecology at the University of Vegas before that. Um, so like, like most of these webinars, we're going to give Kristen about 50, uh, 45 minutes, excuse me, to give her presentation, and then we'll hold questions until the end and have about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, if you don't mind, please enter your questions into the chat, and then we'll, we'll read them off and manage the Q&A at the end. Um, but yeah, feel free to enter those in the chat as we go along. Um, so yeah, go ahead and take it away, Kristen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ellen, and thanks, Ellen Safik, for the introduction. Let me go ahead and share my slides. Does that look good? Yeah, cool. it looks great. Um, well, yeah, thank you everyone for joining today. As someone really new to ANR, it's very exciting to me to be in the space and be participating with all of you. So my talk today is actually pretty broad in scope. I'm going to cover three different projects, but each one addresses a different solution to California's drinking water crisis. And this diversity of projects is intentional in that I hope it reflects the multi-scalar and multifaceted challenges that we face in enacting the human right to water in the state. Um, before I begin, I want to offer a land acknowledgement. I'm speaking today to you today as a visitor in Huchun territory on the lands of the Ohlone people. And the projects I'll cover today span lands of countless other tribes, both recognized and unrecognized from across the state. As a cooperative extension specialist, I also recognize that my work and the institution I represent is a direct product of settler colonialism. And I want to say that I still have a lot to learn. I have a lot to learn as to how I can be accountable for that. Um, and given the focus of my talk today, I want to be explicit in saying that California's indigenous peoples have a long been subject to contested and transformed water injustices across the state um, and across many decades and centuries. And this, those stories and those solutions are not specifically addressed in this talk, but there are many intersections with my focus here on residential drinking water access. I'm going to start today by talking about water system consolidations, which is an ongoing project I'm working on to better understand and hopefully better leverage consolidations to advance access to safe and affordable drinking water in the state. I'm going to spend a bit more time on this project up front than the other two, and that's mostly because this is the project I'm most deep in the weeds on right now. Second, I'm going to spend some time talking about household water, household perceptions of climate risks to their water supply and what the implications of that may be for local adaptation. So that's a project that draws on a representative household survey conducted in April 2021. And lastly, I'm going to spend a bit of time sharing results from an equity analysis of groundwater sustainability plans and what machine learning can tell us about the social and political drivers of those outcomes. But before I jump into talking about solutions to our drinking water crisis, we need a bit of context to understand what I mean when I say that. What is our drinking water crisis? And it's really important for me that you understand that the movement for drinking water justice in California has a very long history and that we have a really long way to go in enacting the vision of in California state's um, 2012 commitment to the human right to water. Um, and I can't think of a better way to convey that message than talking about Sandra Mraz, who's pictured here in the middle of this picture um, with the Alpa sign. And I first met Sandra in 2015. And from that time until she died on January 20th of this year, she was a very cherished mentor to me. So Sandra arrived in the community of Alpa, which is a small unincorporated community in Southeast Tulare County in 1960. And she spent the rest of her life there. She raised her kids there and several generations of other Alpa youth alongside them. Sandra was involved in literally everything in Alpa, um, from schools to food distribution to mosquito abatement. But she is probably best known in the community and across the state for her work on water. So when Sandra first got to Alpa, um, and for a long time thereafter, the community's drinking water was raw ditch water from the local irrigation district. 
And Sandra eventually joined the local water board managing that water system and oversaw their transition to, to a new groundwater well. And she also oversaw their transition to a new community services district to run their water system. In, 20, in 2000, Sandra co-founded the Committee for a Better ALPA, which is known as CBA. And in 2002, when ALPA's only well failed and threw the community into crisis, during this crisis, they discovered that the community was actually had unsafe levels of arsenic, um, although they had never been informed about this. And so for those familiar with drinking water standards, their arsenic levels at the time were 86 parts per billion. The maximum contaminant level or the regulatory standard at that time for drinking water was 50, and now it's 10. So that's very, very high. So Com Committee for a Better ALPA played a really instrumental role in organizing the community locally and at the state level to push for a solution. And they had a huge victory in 2004 when the state invested in a new well and infrastructural upgrades um, for the town. So briefly, they did meet Safe Drinking Water Act standards for arsenic, but then when the arsenic maximum contaminant level was lowered in 2012, they were once again out of compliance. But prior to that, in 2008, Committee for a Better ALPA once again organized the community to block a proposed rate increase. And at the time, residents were already paying $50 a month, which in 2008, in a community with really high poverty levels, is like a huge amount of money. They were paying $50 a month for water, um, and the water still had extremely high levels of arsenic in it. And so the community turned out, Committee for a Better ALPA organized everyone, and they were able to work with the water board to develop a more equitable rate structure, um, which included a small rate increase, but not the proposed $20 rate increase. So through this time, Sandra became a water leader outside of ALPA as well. In 2000, 2007, she was appointed to the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board by then Governor Schwarzenegger. She was the first low income woman of color and the first disadvantaged community resident to serve in that role. And then she was preceded in that role by Denise Kadara of Allensworth, who continues to serve on the board to this day. Sandra was also really heavily involved with the passage of AB 1242 in 2009, which was California's first attempt at a human right to water law. It was then vetoed by Governor Schwarzenegger, and she was then heavily involved again in 2012 with the successful passage and signing of AB 685, our current human right to water law. During this time, she traveled to Sacramento um, like over and over again to give testimony to committees and to meet with legislatures. And then she did it all again in her late 70s for early iterations of what we now know to be SB 200 or the State Safer Program. But it wasn't until last year that a brand new state of the art arsenic treatment facility was brought online in ALPA and the community basically had safe drinking water for the first time in Sandra's 60 year tenure in the community. And so that project was over a decade in the making. Sandra started it followed it start to finish. She attended water board meetings like religiously, even as her health deteriorated in the last few years. And I tell you all this because the State Water Resources Control Board currently maintains a list of systems that, like ALPA for many years, were failing to consistently meet safe drinking water standards. And this, wa this list is known as the Human Right to Water list. And right now there are 385 systems on this list, serving a combined 885,000 Californians. And many of these systems, there's many other systems that are not counted on that list that are struggling intermittently, because to get on that list, you really have to be struggling consistently for years. Um, they're struggling intermittently, they might fall in and out of compliance. Um, and there's also um, many other systems at risk for drought impacts. Um, and in many communities, including ALPA to this day, there's ongoing challenges with water affordability. And so while Sandra is undeniably unique and very special, we have to remember that there are hundreds of other Sandras out there, hundreds um, of grassroots leaders and, and many community-based organizations that are fighting the same fight as Sandra fought in ALPA. And I'm really proud that Sandra died in an ALPA with safe drinking water, which is something she fought so hard for, but that isn't the case in many other places. And we've lost a lot of other movement leaders over the years in communities that didn't yet have long-term solutions. And so all of this brings us back to why we desperately need more and better solutions for realizing the human right to water in the state. So with that context then, I'm gonna jump into the first of the three projects I will cover today. And this one is understanding and leveraging water system consolidations for equity and resilience. 
So this project, like all of the projects I'll cover today, is a collaborative effort. So this one I've been working with with two colleagues from UCLA, Greg Pierce and Justin McBride, and we've had some initial funding for this effort from the Water Foundation. So didn't change. There we go. So generally, consolidation is one end of what we could consider a wider spectrum of water system collaborations. And it turns out, we found out with this project that defining consolidations is actually fairly tricky. So the definition that Justin and Greg and myself have landed on, we're defining consolidation as the formal merging of some or all governance, management, and financial functions of drinking water provision between two or more water system entities. And I know that sounds a little wonky, but we've had to iterate it many times. Um, and based on this definition, we are using the word consolidation to be inclusive of a lot of other terms that you might hear about in different sectors or in different states. Um, so that includes regionalization, acquisition, municipal service extension to domestic wells. And similarly, we're including in this definition both physical consolidation, so that's where two water systems are physically interconnected with new infrastructure, as well as managerial consolidation, where two water systems remain separate, physically separate, but are um, managed by shared staff and potentially even have shared water rates, although that's not always the case. And notably, because with this project, we're partly concerned with the overall reduction of water systems in the state, this definition does not include ownership transfers of systems where the new operating entity was not previously a water system operator or water system provider. So an example of that is the city of Ojai, where the city voted to take back their water system from an investor owned utility, I think maybe 2014, 2015. But we don't consider that to be a consolidation here because Ojai was not previously a drinking water provider. So we're really thinking about the merging of two drinking water providers rather than changes overall, if that makes sense. So consolidation is promoted as having a really wide range of potential be benefits, which is exactly why we care about it. Um, consolidation can grow economies of scale by increasing the population served by a system, um, which in turn spreads fixed costs over a larger customer base and um, thereby increasing economies of scale. Relatedly, consolidation has the potential to increase technical, managerial, and financial capacity, by offering higher salaries, consolidation is thought to potentially help recruit and retain qualified staff. Consolidation can improve water quality, either by connecting a struggling system with one with good water quality, or potentially by providing the economies of scale to install treatment. Consolidation can add or diversify water sources, increasing sustainability and, clim and climate resilience. So the list goes on and on. Point being, many promoted benefits. And for all of those reasons, consolidation has become an extremely hot policy topic in the last few years, really the last 10, but especially the last five. Um, and these are just pictures of three of maybe what is a dozen reports and white papers on consolidation in recent years, all of which promote various possibilities, benefits, approaches, what have you. And the result of all this attention has been that there's also been a lot of policy action. And that is particularly true here in California, where we are very much leading nationally on these efforts. So in the last eight years, we have seen major policy changes related to consolidation. First in 2015, we passed SB 88, which gave the State Water Resources Control Board the authority to mandate consolidation under specific circumstances, um, specifically where systems are failing to provide safe drinking water to a disadvantaged community. In 2016, these powers were expanded under SB 5. Um, 552 to define mobile home parks as disadvantaged communities for the purposes of mandating consolidation. Um, later in 2019, we passed SB 200, which created the flagship Safe and Affordable Funding for Equity and Resilience program, known as SAFER. And this program has consistently prioritized consolidation in its annual needs assessment, as well as its resulting fund extend expenditure plans. Um, so the State Water Board has also really um, developed financial incentives for large systems to consolidate smaller systems in their vicinity. In their vicinity. And interestingly, now prior to investing, um, providing funding for capital improvements, the state board requires that a system assess the potential for consolidation. So the water board is also really working diligently to promote consolidation among potential candidates, 341 of which have been identified um, 
in the needs assessment. They have spent more than 3,000 letters to water systems recommending that they consider consolidation. They've hosted 22 water partnership workshops. And all of this effort has really paid off. Um, since 2015, the state has completed more than 200 water system consolidations, and the state water board currently has 210 projects underway. I'm not going to talk about this more, but just as an interesting note, um, this is not just a California thing. Under the Water Infrastructure Eight, the Water Infrastructure Act passed in 2018, the federal EPA is also undergoing a similar kind of rulemaking and regulatory process related to consolidation, where state primacy agencies are going to be required to assess the potential of consolidation, um, as well as create incentives for promoting consolidation. But lest you get the impression that consolidation is a really rosy success story, um, it really hasn't been. And anyone on this call who's like kind of deep in the drinking water world um, can tell you that. Um, there are a lot of challenges and a lot of unknowns. So many consolidations are taking an inordinately long time to implement on the order of like six to 10 years, even longer. And a lot of time and resources are being invested in projects that sometimes don't come to fruition um, due to political or other roadblocks. Um, so maybe more concerningly, there's almost no empirical research on the outcomes of consolidation. Um, and what research does exist um, has primarily been focused on public to private consolidations or privatization. Um, and it's also primarily focused on large water systems. And that's particularly odd to me because Small systems are generally the focus of consolidation policies, and they're also the type of systems that the consolidation is like promoted to benefit. So it's kind of odd that we've mostly been looking at large systems, but again, there's an extremely small body of literature concerning consolidations out there. And almost none of this work has really addressed outcomes of consolidation. Um, so one exception is a new paper by Dr. Kelsey Piper at Northeastern University that myself and Greg had the um, opportunity to participate in. And in this case, we looked at municipal service extension to a domestic well community in an area of New York. And we found that there were trade-offs between water quality and water affordability with the project, and that residential perceptions of their new water source were impacted by these trade-offs. So for all of these reasons, as I mentioned at the outset, I'm in the process of building out a longer term research and extension agenda on consolidation. So broadly, my objectives are to advance our understanding of the role that water system consolidation plays in increasing access to safe, affordable drinking water, and how consolidations might be leveraged more effectively towards those ends. Um, and given that consolidation is already a top priority in California, I also want to provide information and resources to stakeholders to support the implementation of community-driven consolidation projects. So thus far, we've finished what I'm calling phase one of this project, which um, included an analysis of consolidations completed between 2015 and 2021, which is exactly what I'm going to share with you now. Phase one also included the development of a community guide on structuring and governing consolidations. Um, and that guide also has an accompanying digital toolkit. And we put both of those out in October. So if you're curious about those, which I'm not gonna talk about, you can find them online. So the first step in conducting an analysis of consolidation projects was that we needed to identify the cases. And some of this work had already been done for us by the State Water Board, which tracks the consolidations that they're involved with or consolidations they provide funding for. Um, but thinking back to our definition of consolidation, we wanted to include water system acquisitions or other types of consolidations that the State Water Board might not be involved with. And so to do that, I used fuzzy name matching to compare lists of active water systems um, from early 2015 to the end of 2021. And then I did a lot of tedious Googling to figure out whether that fuzzy name match had to do with a consolidation or it was some other random reason. Um, and originally through these methods, we identified 206 cases. Um, I actually just found three more cases that were finished right at the end of 2021 that I'm going to add to the analysis. But for now, what I'll share with you today is those 206 cases that we identified. And it's worth noting that due to these methods, 
we are likely missing some cases in the state. And I think we're particularly missing cases of regionalization through joint powers authorities, as well as service extension to domestic wells or state small water systems, both of which aren't necessarily going to show up kind of in records, um, in the records that we're relying on, unless the state water board knows of them, and then we're capturing it through their data. So once we had our cases identified, we cobbled together a lot of different data sources for project level variables, such as whether the consolidation was mandatory um, or voluntary, what were the factors motivating the consolidation, dates, funding sources, et cetera. I drew on a lot of public documentation, much of it from the State Water Board, but also from other sources, including the California Public Utilities Commission. For information specific to the water systems involved, so both the consolidated system that's dissolved and the receiving water system that takes on that consolidated water system, we used the Safe Drinking Water Information System, and this includes data related to the water system type, the population served, the water sources, etc. We also draw on a data set that myself and my a colleague Amanda Fensel developed in 2021. So, findings. Um, the 2000, the 206, not 3000, that would be sad. The 206 water systems that we identified, um, um, the consolidated systems we identified, they represent 185 unique projects. And so this number is a little bit lower than the number of water systems because some projects consolidated more than one system. 12% of these projects were managerial consolidations, um, but again, based on our methods for case identification, I think we're missing some cases in that category. Just 2% of the projects were mandated under SB 88, so the other 99% were voluntary. And for the 136 projects where we were able to identify motor factors motivating consolidation, the vast majority, like 110 or 80%, cited water quality concerns. In 14 cases, um, the motivation was cited as disaster impacts. In 12 cases, the motivation cited was um, lack of technical, managerial, or financial capacity. And then in nine cases, we found um, re reference to source water capacity issues, which also includes drought and lack of source water. Um, in, notably, in five cases, the reasons cited for the consolidation were more proactive in nature. So this included vulnerability to future droughts, um, as well as regional water quality concerns, but where that system itself didn't have um, a compliance issue. So the projects we identified spanned 48 of California's 58 counties. On average, consolidated water systems were less than a mile from each other. Um, although for managerial consolidations, the average distance between systems was just over three miles. And something really, I think, important to note that I'll come back to again later is that in nine um, or in nine cases, consolidation spanned more than three miles. And notably, this group doesn't just include managerial consolidations, but physical consolidations as well. So looking specifically at consolidated water systems, so the system that was dissolved through the consolidation, about half of these systems were community water systems, which is to say they served a year-round residential population of more than 25 people. Most of the remainder of the systems were non-transient, non-community systems, which means they served a stable non-residential population, like a school or a business facility. So our data set has two state small water system consolidations, as well as two domestic well consolidations. But again, I think we're missing some of these cases out there because they're not documented in the same ways. Overall, the 200 of the 206 consolidated water systems served about 130,000 people collectively, which is illustrative of the how small these systems are. So the median population served by the 206 systems was just 120. The largest consolidated water system that we documented was um, served a population of a little over 17,000. So 90% of the consolidated water systems relied on groundwater, which I think is also indicative of kind of how important groundwater is both as a drinking water source and as a root challenge in our drinking water, um, for drinking water access in the state. 
So pictured here is Lucy Hernandez and her family at the state capitol. Lucy was, years ago, the president of the West Goshen Mutual Water Company, and she was instrumental in helping her community connect to the city of Visalia after their well failed in 2015. So one of those source capacity issue motivated consolidations. So the 206 water systems that were consolidated, consolidated into 143 unique receiving water systems. And that no number is even lower still because some receiving water systems actually took on several consolidated water systems, sometimes in one project, but also in some cases over many projects. So for example, the South Tahoe Public Utility District consolidated nine separate systems over the seven year study period is pretty impressive. So if we look at the governance of these systems, unlike the existing scholarly literature, which really has focused on public-private consolidations, we see a marked diversity of, um, we see a marked diversity of um, water systems, um, See so a market diversity of water systems, both the consolidated water systems and the receiving water systems. So by far the most common governance category for consolidated water systems comprises private ancillary systems. So 31 at which 31 of which are mobile home parks. So private ancillary in this case is really those private non-residential systems or also mobile home parks. The second most common type of consolidated water system is public ancillary systems, and 20 of those are actually schools, so the kind of public versions of those non-residential systems. Independent special districts are the most common type of receiving water system, followed by general purpose governments, which are primarily cities. And across all these cases, we see 30 different combinations of pre-post consolidation governance. Um, and if we just look at the community water systems, we see 24 kind of pre-post different combinations. So there's a lot of diversity here. And while investor-owned utilities consolidating with other investor-owned utilities is the most common kind of pathway across all the cases, um, we actually do not see a lot of what would constitute privatization of public systems moving into investor-owned utilities. Um, and these charts tell us several important things about the state's drinking water landscape. Um, the first is perhaps unsurprisingly that the motive given, unsurprisingly given what I told you all about the motivations for consolidation, we really see that the largest net reductions in systems is happening among those underperforming water system types, like the private ancillary types, the mobile home parks, the mutual water companies, which I think is a really positive thing. We also see a shift away from the less representative and transparent structures towards more general purpose governments and special districts where there is generally more opportunities for public participation. And again, I think this is a really positive sign for kind of some of the wider rippling effects of consolidation in the state. Um, and then, as I mentioned, while we do see a lot of like IOU to IOU consolidations, we don't see a trend towards um, privatization, which some people were really worried about with consolidation. And maybe even more surprisingly, at least surprising to myself, we actually see IOUs, investor-owned utilities, playing a much smaller role in consolidations than many expected or um, kind of assumed. So the last thing I wanna cover from this analysis relates to the demographics of these systems. So pairing the data set with um, census data, we see that consolidated and receiving systems are by and large very similar in their demographic makeups, although consolidated systems have a slightly lower median household income. But if we do a pairwise analysis comparing the demographics of a consolidated water system to the demographics of the receiving system that it merged into, even that difference basically goes away. Although I do note that in 20% of the cases, we do see a more significant difference between the demographics of the consolidated system and the demographics of the receiving system. And by significant here, we defined that in our um, project as more than 20% difference along two or more um, social demographic um, variables. 
So lastly, zooming in on the demographics of just consolidated water systems, because we really do want to understand who consolidation is serving in the state. About half of consolidated water systems serve disadvantaged community census blocks. That's pretty good. Um, but if we broaden to include more socio-demographic criteria, um, this number drops to 25% when we look at kind of which systems are more than 20% below the statewide average along um, income, percent Latino, or renter rates. In comparison, about 50% of the consolidated systems are above average for two or more of those same criteria, which tells us, in other words, that higher resource communities are consolidating at a rate about twice that of lower resourced communities. So as I said, I'm hoping to continue with this work over the coming years. So the next step for this research includes assessing the human right to water and climate resilience um, and equity outcomes of these different cases. I'm also hoping to identify barriers and opportunities that are impacting consolidation, including looking at the role of county LAFCOs or local agency formation commissions that play a really central role um, in kind of helping move these projects along. And using this information, I want to develop recommendations as well as best practices um, and case studies that can highlight strategies for implementing consolidations that achieve specific benefits or maybe that go beyond low hanging fruit consolidations um, in the future. So with that, then I'm going to transition to some more shorter kind of project snippets. And this second project is um, relates to perceived climate risks to household water supply and the implications for local climate adaptation. There we go. So before jumping in to describing this project, I want to acknowledge my co-authors um, and our funders. I'm working on this paper, um, which is currently under review with several co-authors, including Dr. Melissa, Melissa Beresford, Dr. Amanda Fensel, Dr. Greg Pierce, Dr. Silvia Gonzalez, and Dr. Wendy Jepson. It's a really powerhouse team, and I'm lucky to be a part of it. And in this project, we're leveraging a survey that the group designed as part of the HWISE Collaborative, the Household Water Insecurity Expense Experiences Research Network, which is an NSF, it's a mouthful, an NSF research cluster. And the survey was part of a Cal Speaks survey initiative um, through the CSU Sacramento's Institute for Social Research. So climate change, I think it goes without saying, poses significant threats to household water security. And given this threat, a lot of existing research on the climate drinking water nexus in California has focused on understanding and advancing risk perception among local water managers um, and towards the end of supporting local preparedness, planning, adaptation, et cetera. But in a really awesome 2022 paper by Dr. Megan Classic and her team, they we find that 82% of small water system operators in California report that their adaptation efforts are limited by other stakeholders' failure to acknowledge climate change and or the importance of long-term planning. And this fact really points to what me and my co-authors find to be an underrepresented kind of fact in the literature. And for that matter, even an under, underrepresented fact in policy discussions. And that is that local adaptation to support drinking water access under climate change often requires customer support and or compliance. So this comes in the form of voting in favor of rate adjustments and voting in favor of water related investments from state water bonds to local projects. And it also comes in the form of behaviors. Um, water conservation efforts ultimately are only successful if people buy in and respond by reducing their consumption. So one important piece of the adaptation puzzle becomes how do we get residents to support adaptation efforts? And the research on this suggests that if residents are not concerned about their water supply's future and they do not perceive climate change as a risk to their water security, they're unlikely to engage in supportive actions politically or behaviorally, which in turn raises the question, what factors influence residential concern about household water supply reliability? And so obviously sociopolitical characteristics are related to this, 
But broadly, the climate risk literature also suggests that experiencing climate impacts may increase concern. And so given that we know there are widespread household water impacts in California, we wanted to see how that might play out in a drinking water context. As I previously mentioned, we get at this question leveraging a representative household survey that was fielded through the CSU Sacramento Cal Speaks survey panel. The survey module had 17 questions. Um, climate change was just one of the sections we included. And the survey was fielded in April 2021. We got 704 responses, which is certainly less than we were hoping for. But I think as survey response rates drop overall, we're all just learning to make do. So pictured here is the distribution of survey responses. As you can see, it's fairly representative of the state's population, maybe a tiny bit of overrepresentation um, in the north part of the state. Specifically, we analyzed two survey questions in this paper. The first one is whether in the last five years, the respondent um, had experienced a household water supply impact from an extreme event, and they were able to select all the options that applied from drought, flood, heat waves, landslide, wildfire, and then there was also an other option where they specified an impact. Overall, about a third of our respondents reported one or more impact, which is kind of a lot. Um, and as you can see here, drought was the most common response, which makes sense. 27% um, of respondents reported drought impacts, 7.5% um, of respondents reported wildfire impacts, and 5.5% reported heat wave impacts. So the second question we analyze in this paper is a Likert scale response question asking how much the respondent agrees with the statement, I am concerned about California's water supply reliability. And you'll notice that the response scale was a forced response, so there, that means there was no neutral option. And overall, 85% of those respondents um, agreed um, with, um, were, and which means they were either strongly agreed or agreed with the statement. So the method we used to try to answer our research question um, was an or is an ordinal logistic regression, and the dependent variable in this case is reported concern ordered from least to greatest, one to four. And the covariates we include are reported impacts, and we actually run three separate models to include impacts in different ways. So one model includes impacts by type as a dummy variables. One, mo um, one model includes just a dummy variable for whether they reported any impact or no impact. And then another one includes counts of different types of impacts reported because they were able to select more than one impact. And in this model, we also include localized mid-century climate data from CalADAPT to capture each respondent's kind of geographically situated um, exposure to climate extremes. And we include a count of recent extreme events um, in the respondent's county, which comes from the NOAA storm events database. And we also include kind of well-established controls that are kind of predictors of climate concern, like gender, political ideology, age, et cetera. So here are our results. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm really just gonna highlight a few of them, but happy to come back to this. So generally we find that experiencing one or more extreme weather impacts increases someone's odds of being concerned about future supply reliability by about 150 percent, which is pretty big. Um, interestingly, this effect is also cumulative, um, increasing. So for every additional type of impact a, a respondent reports, they have increasing odds of falling into a higher Likert category by about 80 percent. And we also find that the relationship is dependent on the type of impact experienced. So for some impact types, particularly drought, there's a large positive effect on concern. But for other impact types, particularly fire and floods, we actually see a negative impact on concern, suggesting that these events might be viewed as random or one-off events. Um, um, yeah, it's, um, I guess, makes somewhat sense with climate um, psychology, but it's also a bit discouraging. So a few takeaways from this project, I think it's just worth saying and repeating that very clearly, based on the survey responses, climate impacts to household water supply are a current reality in California. 
Um, and we show that the experience of having your household supply impacted by extreme weather shapes your concern about future supply reliability, but not necessarily equally or in the same way for all types of climate impacts. And this is to say we find support for the argument that perceived risk to household water supply is primarily socially constructed. And the so what for that, at least for me, the applied so what, is that comparing that finding with existing research about how concern influences residential support and compliance, our findings suggest that water managers and decision makers need to concern themselves not just with how climate change is projected to affect their water resources, which will help them plan for those threats, but also with whether and how their residents are perceiving climate impacts, which will help them implement them. So that brings us to the third project, but I also am looking at the clock and realizing I've been talking for 40 minutes. So I don't know if I'm inclined to stop here or Ellen, Safiq, do you, what are your thoughts? Do we have questions? We started a few minutes late, so um, you know, feel free to, to okay. cover what you wanna cover. Um, this is only about eight to 10 minutes. So I'll fly through it um, and then definitely happy to stick around for a little bit of extra time for questions. So, the third project I want to cover briefly today relates to drivers of inequality for small and rural drinking water users in groundwater sustainability plans. Um, this paper came out in October, so I am going to breeze through it. And if you're interested in more details, you can definitely go read it in Policy Studies Journal. Um, but I do want to say before I get started that this um, work comes out of my dissertation and as such has been supported by a whole host of other people, particularly Darcy Bostic, Michael Koo, and Jessica Mendoza. Um, and Michael and Jessica were undergraduates with me at UC Davis um, and have both been involved with this project for now going on three years, which is pretty cool. So I assume most people on this call are familiar with Sigma. Many of us may be too familiar with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. But for those who aren't, I will briefly say that the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which we call Sigma, was passed in 2014 and initiated mandatory groundwater reform um, for all high and medium priority groundwater basins. So those are the basins pictured here in orange and yellow. Um, so the law officially went into effect in 2015 and there are three primary steps. First, local agencies have to form groundwater sustainability agencies known as GSAs, and they had to do that by June, 2017. Secondly, those agencies had until 2020 or 2022, depending on their local conditions, to write groundwater sustainability plans, which would define sustainability locally and also outline a plan to achieve that vision. And then finally, GSAs have until for they have 20 years, so until 2040 or 2042, to implement those plans. So on the expedited timeline, the plans due in 2020, we had 45 plans submitted for state review. Um, and those are the plans I'm going to focus on in this analysis. And for most of those plans, we are currently still waiting for final determinations for the Department of Water Resources. So I used to have to follow that slide with a slide about how Sigma relates to drinking water, but I'm really pleasantly surprised to realize that in the, since 2015, we have come a really long way in recognizing that groundwater is drinking water and that groundwater is at the root of many of our drinking water issues, as kind of the case of El Paso so clearly demonstrates. And so amazing work led by my colleague Darcy Bostic looked at the potential for domestic well dewatering under um, sustainable management criteria proposed in the plan. So basically interpolated future groundwater levels based on the sustainable management criteria each plan set. And we find that the 2020 plans, so the critically overdrafted groundwater sustainability plans, pose a direct potential threat to future drinking water users. So the plans have the potential to dewater as many as 67% of domestic wells in the valley. But as this map really clearly demonstrate of that work, that risk is not evenly distributed. And so what we're really trying to do with this project was to um, characterize some additional um, drinking water related outcomes of these 45 groundwater sustainability plans, and then to understand what factors might correlate with those outcomes. So to do this, we developed a human right to water rubric that allowed for a structured review of groundwater sustainability plans. Ultimately, the rubric had 10 categories and like 46 metrics or questions, which was a lot. 
And then to implement the rubric in an informed way, we also conducted a spatial assessment of drinking water users in the plan boundaries. And we did that using state data. Um, and we did it in order to provide a comparison point that we could look at when we were looking at who and how the plan described drinking water users. So based on that assessment, we know that drinking water users are prolific in the 45 plans submitted in 2020. So these plans cover nearly 250 communities, more than half of which are low income or disadvantaged communities. Um, and in these areas, there are more than 36,000 domestic wells and more than 6,000 public supply wells. So among the other key results from our assessment is we find that many plans fail to fully describe these drinking water users. So for example, two thirds of plans lacked key information about domestic wells, such as their number, their locations, their depths. And while an improvement from the GSA notification phase, a quarter of plans were missing identification of low income communities or disadvantaged communities in their boundaries. 44% of submitted plans set no criteria for drinking water constituents, such as nitrates or arsenic. And those that did set criteria mostly were mostly not aligned with state and federal drinking water standards or MCLs. And interestingly, for those that did set their drink standards aligned with state drinking water standards, many of them allowed for kind of up to a 20% threshold beyond those levels um, before um, remedy or remedial work would take place. So the last kind of a part I want to talk about these plans before I dive into the um, machine learning results is that an essential component of GSPs are those proposed projects and management actions that will take us from where we are to where we want to be in those 20 years. And just 15 of the 45 plans included projects that had drinking water benefits, and 12 of the 34 plans that had low-income communities in their boundaries, just 12 of those 34 plans included projects that would benefit those low-income communities. And so this is somewhat disappointing for me because I think for myself and I think for a lot of people in the early phases of Sigma, the prospect of multi-benefit projects that really supported groundwater sustainability in um, and like diverse ways was really kind of what was one of the most exciting parts about Sigma early on. Um, so further, few plans included mitigation as part of their management actions, just five plans committed to developing mitigation programs for addressing adverse impacts to shallow wells. So lastly, just a kind of brief hint at um, this kind of the second part of our question, which was trying to understand what factors might be associated with this variation that we document. And so to do this, I used a machine learning method known as boosted classification and regression trees. I am not going to get into this because I think it's too far into the weeds of exactly how it works for most people. But in our analyses, we used three different dependent variables, those three I just covered right now. So the overall assessment score, a factor variable describing whether the plan set water quality criteria in line with state drinking water standards, and then whether or not the plan included projects with drinking water benefits. And then we also include 13 independent variables across five categories, which I'll show you on the next slide. So here are the five independent variable categories. They have really wonky names thanks to the peer review process. Um, and um, I don't love them, but collaborative extent basically refers to how, how many different parties were involved in authoring the plan. Elite power refers to the concentration of agricultural interests in the plan area. Representation refers to representation for drinking water users in the GSP development process. Stakeholder engagement relates to more um, public participation, like workshops, public meetings, et cetera, public comment. Um, and finally, problem severity, which captures how serious of an issue drinking water access is in the plan area. And we find some really interesting results, um, and I'll just highlight a few of those to end out with. So the first is that on average across the three different models, nearly 30% of the model explained variance is attributed to representation for drinking water users in the process. And to me, this is particularly interesting when we compare it to the average for stakeholder engagement, which only is associated with about 10% of the cumulative relative influence. 
And this is interesting to me because stakeholder engagement is really where our primary policy focus is, both for Sigma and where it has been for many other programs as well. So another key finding in this paper is that in a lot of cases, we detect nonlinear relationships between the independent variables and the dependent variables. So we just take drinking water representation as an example. We see here that having up to 20% of a board representing drinking water has almost no relationship with the overall assessment score. But when we increase board representation from 20 to 40%, we see a noticeable increase in overall assessment score, after which point, again, the association levels off. We also see that these associations appear to be outcome specific. So certain factors are more influential for certain outputs than others. So here we see that elite power or that concentration of agricultural interests is most associated with assessment scores. And in this case, this is a negative association. And we see that representation is most positively associated with the setting of water quality criteria in a way that aligns with drinking water standards. We also see that the magnitude of these different relationships varies among um, dependent variables. So overall, we see the drinking water projects dependent variable as being the most influenceable. So in other words, um, that's where we see the most change as the 13 factors we assess change. But gains in water quality thresholds, on the other hand, are much less responsive. Overall, we see only the most marginal improvements in water quality thresholds. Um, even under what the model tells us are the most favorable conditions. Uh, assessment scores similarly don't change a ton across the spectrum of independent variables, um, which I think is not the most, basically for me, the outcome, the takeaway from that is that while the, all of these things matter, all 13 independent variables we include here matter, and we can see the evidence of that in this table, we're all also not going to see huge changes in groundwater sustainability plans relying on only these levers. And I think while slightly disappointing um, is certainly something good to know moving forward. So with that, I will conclude and we can jump to questions. Sorry that I went a bit over time. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I want to start with a question in the chat um, that actually goes back to the first presentation for the first project you presented um, from Graham Fogg. Uh, hi, Graham. Um, he asks uh, if a GSA manages the groundwater system in a way that deprives some of its population of safe drinking water, should the GSA bear some or all of the responsibility of supplying replacement or sustainable water supplies? It's a question, Graham, that, as you know, people are fighting about right now. Um, and I don't know if you said, Ellen, that this relates to consolidation, but I also think there's a really interesting relationship to consolidation with groundwater sustainability agencies, specifically related to replacement water. Um, I think that long term, we are not going to achieve the human right to water without sustainable groundwater management. And so human right to water outcomes have to be integrated into the Sigma process. Like, and what that looks like and who bears what costs, what part of that comes from safer or other funding sources, I don't have the answers to that, but undeniably, we can't achieve sustainable groundwater management for the state without fully integrating drinking water access into that regime. And I don't think we're there yet. So I, that's where I would say on that. But I will just say on the consolidations front and how those two intersect, there's been some really interesting questions because we do see systems that are potential candidates for consolidation that span two different groundwater sustainability agencies and how responsibility and water use and various questions get worked out when we're managing in groundwater basins that maybe don't reflect the boundaries of a consolidation is a question that um, so far I think is working out on a case by case basis, but I do think there's some need to kind of more generally think about how consolidation intersects with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act when it comes to projects. If I could uh, ask a follow-up, yeah. and, and maybe you covered it in the last third of your presentation, if, um, if there's not adequate representation on the GSAs amongst the smaller players, um, well, first of all, it seems like there's a lot of cases where the elite have a disproportionate effect on 
the process and the decision making. <clears throat> what needs to be done to correct that? And and it is there. And again, maybe you covered it, but are there hopeful signs that uh, that equity within the GSAs is uh, improving or will improve in the future? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think what we see from that final analysis I presented is that representation matters. It matters a whole lot more than stakeholder engagement matters. And that's why I kind of made that comment that we focused a lot of policy attention on stakeholder engagement, public comment, and we're seeing a lot more influence from representation. But I think the other take home from that project is that representation is not going to solve the issue. And we really do see you don't just need one drinking water representative on a board to see that results like in the analysis, we actually need kind of a critical mass and that's not probably practical in most of these scenarios. And so for me, kind of where I move from that question, I think representation is important and I think it's important for more things than I capture in that analysis. So I'm not saying um, I think we should increase representation in all of these processes, but I think we also need to be looking towards how we integrate Sigma more broadly with drinking water regulation and drinking water kind of programs in the state. And some of that could become, could be done kind of more on the state side and more on the policy side, rather than leaving it up to individuals to kind of show up at every GSA board meeting and fight for their drinking water access. Like I think there's more systems level, policy level ways for us to integrate these processes. And to me, that's where I think we might see more progress. Um, but that's politically challenging. Um, and, you know, Sigma was such a huge lift to pass and implement in the state that we're certainly not in a place where anyone's interested in tinkering with it for better or for worse. Um, let's try to get at least one more question um, while we still have the recording going. Um, and then, you know, folks want to stick around to ask you more. Um, but so we have one from uh, Mariana in the chat saying, based on your results with machine learning in Sigma, what strategies would you suggest to increase efforts and attention dedicated to drinking water concerns in GSPs? Do you have suggestions? Uh, on where GSAs and others working to advocate for attention to equity and drinking water security in Sigma focus on, on energy and resources? So it's a great question. One thing I would point to is like new data and tools. And we've seen kind of in the last couple of years, several new mapping tools and data portals come both through the state, through Department of Water Resources has a new one, as well as through nonprofit organizations like Community Water Center. And there's a kind of in the last couple of years, we now have much more easily accessible information where a groundwater sustainability agency can look at their plan area, can look at their groundwater basin and can more easily identify disadvantaged communities, drinking water wells, drinking water risks. And I, I'm hopeful that that's going to help. So I, I mean, I think first and foremost, I'd point people to start using those tools that have been developed. Um, and many of those kind of came online after these 2020 plans were developed and we might see more of their use in the 2022 plans. Um, and then I think, honestly, one of the biggest changes we've seen is a lot more media attention and policy attention to the intersection with drinking water and Sigma. When I started this work in 2015, we weren't talking about Sigma as a drinking water issue. And I'm really glad that we are and that that's more common now. And I think that the more we talk about Sigma as a drinking water issue, the more integration we're going to get just kind of by through awareness. So that's another, another point. And then um, Safiq, I'll just like briefly speak to your question I see in the chat, because I think it's a really important and good question. Um, he asked to speak to the downsides of consolidation. And I can't really speak to this quite yet because my next phase in this research is really to document out outcomes. And that's something I do want to do because I, I will say, I think we have spent a lot of time promoting the potential benefits of consolidation, and we don't have a lot of evidence to support those. And I think there's a real potential that there are downsides, but certainly that paper that um, Dr. Piper led out of Northeastern shows there are trade-offs. And I think the more we document outcomes, we're gonna see that there are trade-offs between water quality, water affordability, um, you know. And so thinking about those trade-offs and how do we design consolidations that maximize specific benefits or maximize kind of what we're saying are the most desired benefits is really where I hope to go in the future. 
Um, but affordability is a real serious one. I think we're, I don't think by nature of consolidations, I think we're often seeing rates go up. I um, mean, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and then, yeah, trade-offs. Um, yeah, I, I am really excited to go there. That's kind of the next step of the project. But I do want to lift that up, that I think there are downsides. And I think some of the benefits aren't materializing, or at least all the benefits aren't materializing in every project. So I think that's where we kind of need to go on this work. Great. Well, thank you, Kristen. And please all join me in thanking Kristen for the, for the webinar. Thanks everyone for coming.